Are you a number cruncher? No, I don't mean an accountant or a computer. I mean a person who abuses the word number by not observing the proper distinction between the words number and amount. Would you say the amount of people at the party or the number of people at the party? Would you say the amount of things I have to do today or the number of things I have to do today? If you chose number, then you've called the right number this time. If you chose amount, you won't amount to much unless you follow this advice. Number refers to things that can be counted, itemized, or enumerated. In other words, considered separately or individually. We speak of the number of people at an event, a number of things to do, a number of problems to solve, the number of grocery items in a bag, the number of papers on your desk, or the number of volts in an electric current. Amount refers to things that are considered collectively, in other words, as a mass or whole. We speak of the amount of sugar in a recipe, the amount of trouble we are having, the amount of food we buy at the store, the amount of paper on your desk. The word number gives educated speakers and writers trouble in one other way. Namely, when you hook it to a plural noun, should you use a singular or a plural verb? Here's another quiz to test your number literacy. Would you say a number of boxes was sent or a number of boxes were sent? Would you say the number of boxes are small or the number of boxes is small? Would you say a low number of crimes was committed or a low number of crimes were committed? And finally, would you say the number of tasks on my to-do list are small, or the number of tasks on my to-do list is small? If you chose the second sentence in each case, your number literacy is excellent. Here's the rule for using number with singular and plural verbs. When number is preceded by the indefinite article a, as a number, the construction is plural and requires a plural verb. A number of things were done. A number of people are here. A number of new employees have joined the health club, not has joined. Now, when number is preceded by the definite article the, as the number, the construction is singular and requires a singular verb. The number of things left to do is overwhelming. The number of people in attendance is 50. The number of members in the organization has decreased, not have decreased. Remember, a number is always plural. The number is always singular. Now let's return to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the next 10 keywords in level 10. Pay close attention because we're coming down the home stretch and I'm going to pick up the pace. Word 31. Nacreous. N-A-C-R-E-O-U-S. Pearly. Consisting of or resembling mother of pearl. Synonyms of nacreous include iridescent, which means having or displaying lustrous rainbow-like colors, and the unusual word margaritaceous. The Random House Webster's College Dictionary defines mother of pearl as a hard, iridescent substance that forms the inner layer of certain mollusk shells, used for making buttons, beads, etc. Mother of pearl also goes by the name nacre, spelled N-A-C-R-E. The adjective corresponding to the noun nacre is nacreous, pearly made of or resembling mother of pearl. Word 32. Fainient. F-A-I-N-E-A-N-T. Lazy. Idle. Sluggish. Good for nothing. When her 30-year-old son refused to get a job and demanded more money as an allowance, Mrs. Jones decided that enough was enough and it was time to kick her fainient offspring out of the house.
Common synonyms of fainéant include do-nothing, shiftless, slothful, and lackadaisical, which is often mispronounced laxadaisical. There is no lax in lackadaisical. More challenging synonyms of fainéant include lethargic, indolent, somnolent, torpid, otios, O-T-I-O-S-E, and also hebetudinous, the adjective corresponding to the noun hebetude, word 20 of level 10. Fainéant comes from a French phrase meaning to do nothing. Fainéant may be used as an adjective to mean lazy, good for nothing, or as a noun to mean a lazy person, an idler, sluggard. The corresponding noun is fainéance, spelled F-A-I-N-E-A-N-C-E. Fainéance means idleness, inactivity, indolence, or the lazy, do-nothing attitude of a fainéant person. If you look up fainéant in a current dictionary, you may find the French pronunciation, fainéant, listed first or even listed alone. Frankly, I find that perplexing, because two of the 20th century's most respected arbiters on pronunciation, the second edition of Webster's New International Dictionary, published in 1934, and Kenyon and Knott's Pronouncing Dictionary of American English, published in 1949, both prefer the pronunciation fainéant. Fainéant entered English in the early 1600s. After nearly 400 years, it's expected and sensible to anglicize a word, make it conform to English custom. And when an anglicized pronunciation has existed in educated speech for 50 years or more, it doesn't make much sense to retain or revive the foreign pronunciation. In my opinion, it's one thing to use a $20 word in conversation. It's quite another thing to use it with a pretentious pronunciation. Word 33. Hispid. H-I-S-P-I-D. Covered with stiff hairs, bristles, or small spines. Rough and bristly. The words hispid and hirsute, spelled H-I-R-S-U-T-E, are close in meaning. Hispid comes from the Latin hispidus, rough, hairy, bristly. Although the Oxford English Dictionary contains one figurative citation that refers to a hispid law, hispid is used chiefly in a literal sense of leaves, plants, insects, animals, and occasionally human beings and inanimate objects, to mean covered with rough, stiff hairs or bristles. The nettle, with its small stinging spines, is a hispid plant. Although the spines of the porcupine are relatively large, the animal can fairly be described as hispid. Hirsute, also pronounced hirsute, comes from the Latin hirsutus, covered with hair, rough, shaggy. In botany and zoology, hirsute and hispid are synonymous. In general usage, however, hirsute means extremely hairy or covered with hair. Word 34. Longanimity. L-O-N-G-A-N-I-M-I-T-Y. Long-suffering patience. The ability to calmly endure hardship or suffering. Longanimity and forbearance are synonyms. Longanimity comes ultimately from the Latin longus, meaning long, and animus, spirit, mind. By derivation, a person who displays longanimity has the strength of spirit and mind, word 35. Sciolist. S-C-I-O-L-I-S-T. A person who has only superficial knowledge of a subject or who pretends to have knowledge. Sciolist and the corresponding noun sciolism, spelled S-C-I-O-L-I-S-M, come through a Latin word meaning a smatterer, and ultimately from the Latin scire, to know. By derivation and in modern usage, 
A sciolist is a person who has only a smattering of knowledge, and sciolism means superficial or pretended knowledge. Sciolist may also apply to people who pretend to be more knowledgeable or learned than they are, or who make a pretentious display of what little they know. As the saying goes, a little learning is a dangerous thing. The sciolist is a person you either want to avoid or watch carefully, because a small mind containing only a smattering of knowledge is likely to think mean, small-minded thoughts. Word 36. Propinquity. P-R-O-P-I-N-Q-U-I-T-Y. Nearness in place or time. Proximity. Also, nearness or similarity in nature, kinship, close relation. In Latin, propinquitas means either nearness, proximity, or friendship, relationship. From this Latin word comes the English adjective propinquity, which is used to mean either nearness in place or time, or nearness of blood or nature. According to the second edition of Webster's New International Dictionary, proximity denotes simple nearness, as the proximity of their houses, or living in proximity to downtown. Propinquity connotes close neighborhood and personal vicinity, as the propinquity of marriage, the propinquity of brothers and sisters, the propinquity of vice on the mean streets of the big city, or the hebdomadal propinquity of Christmas and New Year's Day. Hebdomadal means weekly or pertaining to a week, remember? Word 37. Factitious. F-A-C-T-I-T-I-O-U-S. Not natural or genuine. Produced artificially. Synonyms of factitious include sham, contrived, bogus, fraudulent, and spurious, word 18 of level 8. Factitious comes through the Latin facticius, made by art, artificial, from the verb facere, to make. A factitious word is not genuine, it has been made up. A factitious need is artificially produced. A factitious smile is unnatural and manufactured for the occasion. And when something has factitious value, its value is not genuine or intrinsic, but has been artificially created or imposed. According to the Century Dictionary, an artificial or factitious demand in the market is one that is manufactured. The factitious demand, word 38. Plexiform. P-L-E-X-I-F-O-R-M In general, complicated or elaborate. Specifically, like a plexus or network. According to the Random House Webster's College Dictionary, the noun plexus, spelled P-L-E-X-U-S, means a network or any complex structure containing an intricate network of parts as the plexus of international relations. In medicine, plexus is used to describe various networks of nerves and blood vessels. Plexus comes from the Latin plectere, to braid, intertwine, interweave. The adjective plexiform combines the word plexus and the suffix form to mean formed like a plexus or network. Plexiform may be used in this sense as the plexiform nature of computer bulletin boards and online services. However, outside the fields of medicine and science, plexiform probably is more often used in a more general sense to mean having the qualities of a complex network, and therefore extremely complicated or elaborate. We speak of the plexiform nature of human relationships, a plexiform bureaucracy, Plexiform negotiations, the plexiform operations of a multinational corporation, or the plexiform financial structure of Wall Street. Word 39. Susurrus. S-U-S-U-R-R-U-S. 
a soft, subdued sound, a whispering, murmuring, muttering, or rustling sound. A susurrus and a susurration are the same thing. The corresponding verb is susurrate, to whisper, murmur, and the adjective is susurrant, softly whispering, rustling, or murmuring. All of these soft-sounding words come from the Latin susurrare, to whisper, murmur, mutter. A susurrus or a susurration, pick the soft-sounding word you prefer, can apply to many things, because so many things create a whispering, murmuring, muttering, or rustling sound. Here are three possible applications off the top of my head. The susurrus in the library. The susurration of the trees. As the lights dimmed and the curtain rose, a susurrus passed through the audience and then died away. Word 40. Triturate. T-R-I-T-U-R-A-T-E. To grind, crush, or pound into fine particles or powder. Synonyms of triturate include pulverize, comminute, and levigate. To pulverize and to triturate are virtually interchangeable. Both words suggest reducing something to fine particles or powder. Pulverize comes from the Latin pulvis, dust, and by derivation suggests reducing something to dust. Triturate comes from a Latin word meaning to thresh grain or tread out corn and by derivation suggests a violent beating, bruising, pounding, crushing, rubbing, or grinding action. When used figuratively, pulverized is the more violent word and means to destroy or demolish completely, as to pulverize an opponent. Used figuratively, triturate suggests either a grinding or crushing into small pieces or a wearing down to nothing by friction. Her job was triturating all her creative abilities. He triturated his financial assets until he was bankrupt. The corresponding noun is trituration. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned by playing one of these definitions doesn't fit the word. I will say a word followed by three apparent synonyms, but only two of those three words or phrases will be true synonyms. One will be unrelated in meaning. You have to decide which one of the three ostensible synonyms or phrases doesn't fit the word. Are you ready? Here we go. Nacreous means grimy, pearly, iridescent. Grimy doesn't fit. Nacreous means pearly, consisting of or resembling mother of pearl. Fainient means lazy, uncooperative, idle. Uncooperative doesn't fit. Fainient means lazy, idle, sluggish, good for nothing. Hispid means bristly, hairy, bumpy. Bumpy doesn't fit. Hispid means covered with stiff hairs, bristles, or small spines. Rough and bristly. Longanimity means patience, endurance, long life. Long life doesn't fit. Longevity means long life or the duration of life. Longanimity means long-suffering patience. The ability to calmly endure hardship or suffering. A sciolist is a person with superficial knowledge, a person without knowledge, a person who pretends to have knowledge. A person without knowledge doesn't fit. A sciolist is a person who has only superficial knowledge of a subject or who pretends to have knowledge. Propinquity means propriety. Proximity, nearness. Propriety doesn't fit. Propriety means proper behavior or appropriateness, suitability. Propinquity means nearness in place or time. Proximity. 
Also, nearness or similarity in nature, kinship, close relation. Factitious means not natural, not original, produced artificially. Not original doesn't fit. Factitious means not natural or genuine, produced artificially. Plexiform means widespread, complicated, elaborate. Widespread doesn't fit. Plexiform means complicated or elaborate, specifically like a plexus or network. A susurrus is a whispering sound, a murmuring sound, a bubbling sound. A bubbling sound doesn't fit. A susurrus is a whispering, murmuring, muttering, or rustling sound. The words susurrus and susurration are synonymous and interchangeable. To triturate means to grind up, make a mess of, crush into fine particles. Make a mess of doesn't fit. To triturate means to grind, crush, or pound into fine particles or powder. That concludes the review for this section. Some of us are lovers of the long word. We thrill at the sight and sound of the odd, the overblown, and the obscure. Like bird watchers or butterfly collectors who traverse mountains, penetrate jungles, or trudge through swamps for a glimpse of some rare species, we slog through the daily mire of language, hoping to lay eyes on a lexicographic dinosaur or linguistic Loch Ness monster. To us, the short, straightforward words we have been force-fed and made to regurgitate are like so many indistinguishable ants in an endless and tiresome trail of sentences. If you are a secret or not-so-secret lover of the long word, then perhaps you already know that the long word for long words is sesquipedalian, spelled S-E-S-Q-U-I-P-E-D-A-L-I-A-N. It comes from the Roman poet Horace's phrase, sesquipedalia verba, which means literally, words a foot and a half long. Sesquipedalian may also refer to anything a foot and a half long, such as a sesquipedalian hot dog. If you enjoy munching on a foot and a half long word from time to time, here is a smorgasbord of sesquipedalian monsters that should provide enough verbal nutrition to last you several months. Try these out for size. From the fancy words for simple ideas department come muliobriety, which means femininity, womanhood. Obnubilation, clouding over, obscuring. Circulation, weeding with a hoe. Immerigerous, rude, uncivil, disobedient. And vivisepulture, the act of burying someone alive. One of my favorites in this category is Chris Elephantin, which means made of gold and ivory. From the utterly outrageous department come bruxomania, the habit of grinding the teeth, especially in sleep or under stress. Philopatridomania, a fanatic case of homesickness. Azygophrenia, the psychoneurosis of single life. Oxorodespotism, wifely tyranny. Borborygmus, the sound of gas passing through the intestines, a gurgling in your gut. Cacophonophilist, a lover of harsh sounds. Sacerdotophrenia, clerical stage fright, fear of the pulpit, the mere thought of which is enough to make any preacher horripilate, get goosebumps. And finally, if you are mathematically challenged, you can chew on the redoubtable word zenzazenzazenzik, which means the eighth power of a number. Perhaps by now you're wondering, just how long can you get? Well, pretty doggone long. I'm not going to give you the longest word in the language. It's a chemical term that has 1913 letters and would take almost a minute to pronounce. I will leave you, however, with three of the longest pronounceable words around. The rare and fascinating word bathysideroidromophobia is formed from the Greek bathy, meaning deep, sidero, 
meaning iron, dromo, meaning a course or track, and phobia, which means fear. By derivation, bathysiderodromophobia means fear of a deep iron course or track, hence fear of subways or underground trains. The risible word, floxinosa nihilopilification, which has 29 letters, means the act of categorizing something as trivial or worthless. In his delightful book, Crazy English, Richard Letterer notes that floxinosa nihilopilification dates back to 1741 and is the longest word in the Oxford English Dictionary. Weighing in at 30 letters is the heavyweight word hippopato monstro sesquipedalian, which, appropriately enough, means pertaining to an extremely long word. Writing down wonderfully worthless words like bathysiderodromophobia, floxinosa nihilopilification, and hippopato monstro sesquipedalian can give you a bad case of graphospasm, which is the technical term for writer's cramp. I hope all those big words haven't knocked the wind out of you, but if they have, here is a breath of fresh air. Word 41. Protean. P-R-O-T-E-A-N. Highly variable or changeable, readily assuming different shapes, forms, characters, or meanings. The adjective protean is an eponymous word, a word derived from a name. It comes from Proteus, the name of a sea god in ancient Greek mythology who could change his shape at will. That which is protean is changeable like Proteus, able to quickly take on different shapes, forms, characters, or meanings. A master of disguise is protean, taking on the appearance of different characters. Words can sometimes be protean, taking on different meanings. Dreams are often protean, assuming different forms. A person's career can be protean, full of changes, and in my house at least, let word 42. Crepitate. C-R-E-P-I-T-A-T-E. To crackle. Make a crackling, snapping, or popping noise. The verb to crepitate comes from the Latin crepitare, to crackle, creak, rattle, or clatter. From the same source, we inherit the word decrepit, which by derivation means having bones that creak and rattle from old age and also the unusual word crepitaculum, the rattle or rattling organ of the rattlesnake. To crepitate means to do what the ads tell us the cereal does, snap, crackle, and pop. The corresponding adjective is crepitant, crackling or creaking, as the crepitant stairs of an old house. The corresponding noun is crepitation, as the crepitations of firecrackers on the 4th of July. In medicine, a crepitation is the grating sound or sensation produced by rubbing together the fractured ends of a broken bone. Ouch! Let's leave that painful image behind us now and move to word 43. Noctivagant. N-O-C-T-I-V-A-G-A-N-T. Wandering at night. Noctivagant comes from the Latin noctuagus wandering by night, which comes in turn from nox, meaning night, and wagari, to wander about. This Latin wagari is also the source of the English adjective vague, literally wandering in thought, vagabond, a wanderer, and vagari, which is now often pronounced vagary. A vagari, spelled v-a-g-a-r-y, is an odd, whimsical idea, or an unpredictable, capricious action or event, as the vagaries of the stock market. Our keyword, the adjective noctivagant, means wandering in the night. Burglars, streetwalkers, and barhoppers are all noctivagant, but I'm sure you can come up with more pertinent applications for this rare but useful word. The corresponding noun is noctivagation, the act of wandering in the night. Word 44. Fuliginous. F-U-L-I-G-I-N-O-U-S. Sooty. Smoky. 
pertaining to, resembling, or consisting of soot or smoke. Fuliginous comes from the Latin fuligo, soot. The word entered English in the 1600s, and since then has been used both literally to mean sooty or smoky, and figuratively to mean dark, dusky, or obscure. Fuliginous air is filled with soot or smog. When you clean the windows of your car, you wash off the fuliginous grime. A fuliginous bar is a dark and smoky bar. Fuliginous ideas or thoughts are darkened as if by soot. And word 45. Hortatory. H-O-R-T-A-T-O-R-Y. Encouraging or urging to some course of action. Giving earnest counsel or advice. The verb to exhort, spelled E-X-H-O-R-T, the noun exhortation, and the adjective hortatory all come from the Latin hortari, to encourage, incite. To exhort means to urge or advise earnestly to do what is deemed right or proper, as public service announcements that exhort people not to drink and drive. An exhortation is a statement that exhorts, or, as Webster's New International Dictionary, 2nd edition, puts it, language intended to incite and encourage. Adolf Hitler's racist and chauvinistic exhortations led the German people into World War II. The adjective hortatory means characterized by exhortations. A hortatory speech or sermon encourages or urges the audience to some course of action. A hortatory word 46. Heliolatry. H-E-L-I-O-L-A-T-R-Y. Worship of the sun. The combining form, helio, spelled H-E-L-I-O, comes from the Greek helios, the sun and is used in English words to mean the sun. For example, heliotherapy is a form of medical treatment involving exposure to sunlight. In astronomy, heliocentric means regarding the sun as the center of our planetary system, as opposed to geocentric, which refers to the pre-Copernican notion that the sun revolves around the Earth. The fascinating word, heliotropism, is formed from helio, the sun, and the Greek tropos, a turning. Heliotropism refers to the tendency of plants to bend or move toward, or in some cases away from, a source of light. Our keyword, heliolatry, combines helio, the sun, with the Greek latreia, meaning worship. The corresponding noun is heliolater, word 47. Siamaki. S-C-I-A-M-A-C-H-Y Shadow boxing The act of fighting a shadow or an imaginary enemy. Siamaki comes from the Greek skia, a shadow, and make, a battle, contest, struggle. This Greek make is the source of an English combining form spelled M-A-C-H-Y, which, when tacked onto a word, denotes a battle, contest, or struggle. Theomachy is a battle against or between gods. Gigantomachy is a war or battle between giants or superhuman beings. Logomachy, from the Greek logos, meaning word, is a battle of words. And our key word, siamachy, is a battle with a shadow, a contest with an imaginary enemy. Word 48. Glabrous. G-L-A-B-R-O-U-S. Smooth and bald. Glabrous comes from the Latin glaver, without hair, bald, and is used chiefly in biology of something that has a smooth surface without hair, down, fuzz, or other projections. In my humble opinion, a refined word meaning smooth and bald has the potential for many applications outside the realm of science. I offer two examples to point you in the right direction. The amazing Michael Jordan's glabrous head. And 
the glabrous bodies of maidens in bikinis practicing heliolatry. Word 49. Pettifogger. P E T T I F O G G E R. A mean, tricky lawyer, especially a lawyer who handles petty cases in an unethical, unscrupulous way. Pettifogger is synonymous with the more familiar word shyster, spelled S H Y S T E R. The proverbial ambulance chaser is also a breed of pettifogger. The corresponding verb to pettifog means to carry on a law practice in a petty, tricky, unscrupulous way. By extension, it has also come to mean to engage in chicanery or unethical practices in a business of any sort. The noun pettifoggery means the unethical, unscrupulous practices of a pettifogger, legal tricks, or chicanery. Word 50. Epicene. E P I C E N E. Having characteristics or qualities of both sexes. Epicene comes through Middle English and Latin from a Greek word meaning in common. By derivation, that which is epicene has characteristics in common with both sexes. Many paintings and sculptures, both classical and modern, depict epicene figures. Because something that displays characteristics of both sexes is, by all rights, not a member of one sex or the other, epicene has come to mean not having the characteristics or qualities of either sex, sexless, neuter, as an epicene hairstyle or epicene clothing. And because something sexless lacks sex appeal, epicene is also sometimes used disparagingly of style to mean lacking appeal or potency, feeble, flaccid, as an epicene novel or epicene architecture. Finally, when applied to a man, or at least to someone presumed to be a man biologically, epicene is always used disparagingly to mean not virile, effeminate. The words hermaphroditic and epicene both suggest having characteristics of both sexes, but in different ways. Hermaphroditic is the adjective corresponding to the noun hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite is an eponymous word. It comes from the name hermaphroditus. In Greek mythology, Hermaphroditus was the son of Hermes, the messenger of the gods, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. While bathing one day, Hermaphroditus was the victim of a contretemps that united him in one body with a water nymph named Salmasis. In modern usage, a hermaphrodite is a person who has the reproductive organs of both sexes. Epicene does not usually suggest having both male and female reproductive organs, but rather having a range of characteristics of... Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you the review word followed by three words or phrases, and you decide which of those three words or phrases comes nearest the meaning of the review word. Are you ready? Let's begin. Does something protean have a powerful influence, assume different shapes or forms, or have indistinct features? Something protean is highly variable or changeable. Protean means readily assuming different shapes, forms, characters, or meanings. Does crepitate mean to tremble, to crackle, or to beg? Crepitate means to crackle, make a crackling, snapping, or popping noise. Does a noctivagant person wander about on foot, wander about in the night, or wander about while asleep. A noctivagant person wanders about at night. A somnambulant person wanders while asleep. A peripatetic person wanders about on foot. Noctivagant means wandering at night. When something is fuliginous, is it wicked, smelly, or sooty? 
Something fuliginous is sooty, smoky. Is a hortatory speech encouraging, amusing, or angry? Hortatory means encouraging or urging to some course of action, giving earnest counsel or advice. Is heliolatry the worship of false gods, the worship of celebrities, or the worship of the sun? Heliolatry is worship of the sun. Does siamaki mean a mortal combat, shadow boxing, or talking to oneself? Siamaki means shadow boxing, the act of fighting a shadow or an imaginary enemy. Is something glabrous, smooth and bald, rough and bumpy, or soft and lustrous? Something glabrous is smooth and bald. Is a pettifogger an incompetent doctor, a foolish old person, or a mean, tricky lawyer? A pettifogger is a mean, tricky lawyer, especially a lawyer who handles petty cases in an unethical, unscrupulous way. Does epicene mean having deep wisdom, having characteristics of both sexes, or having a delicate, refined sensibility? Epicene means having characteristics or qualities of both sexes. That concludes the review for this section and for the Verbal Advantage program. Remember to listen to this entire level again at least once before moving on with your life. Let's finish off the program with a final forego of fulminations on pronunciation. A special reminder here to be on the qui vive regarding the word nuclear. Don't say nuclear. Think of nuclear as a combination of new or new and clear. Say nuclear or nuclear. I'm going to run through the rest of the list quickly, so open your ears wide and prepare your memory banks for rapid assimilation. Schizophrenia is properly pronounced schizophrenia, not schizophrenia. The accent properly should be on the first syllable in the words exquisite and hospitable. Weather prognosticators who tell us about the atmospheric conditions properly should tell us about the atmospheric conditions. How do you pronounce the word spelled P-R-E-L-U-D-E? -E? Don't say prelude, that's a vogue pronunciation. The preferred pronunciation is prelude, with prelude as an acceptable alternative. The pronunciations envelope and envoy are pseudo-French. These words are thoroughly English and should be pronounced envoy and envelope. Don't pronounce the H in vehicle and herb, and don't say zoology or zoologist, as if these words had three O's. Say zoology and zoologist. Also, don't pronounce the extra in extraordinary. The word has five syllables, not six. Be sure to clearly pronounce the H in huge and human. Don't say huge and human. For the abbreviation ETC period, take your time and say etc. It's sloppy to say etc., and even worse to say etc. You know the eating disorder many people call bulimia? Well, guess what? The proper pronunciation is bulimia. This medical term entered the language in the 14th century, and until the 1980s, the only pronunciation recognized by dictionaries was bulimia. It may be disconcerting at first to be the only one in the neighborhood who says bulimia, but I guarantee you'll get used to it. You will also be right. What you probably have often heard called a schism, S-C-H-I-S-M, is in fact a schism. Believe it or not, schism is the first and often the only pronunciation listed in dictionaries. And last but not least, how do you pronounce the name of your credit card? 
the one spelled V-I-S-A. Do you say visa or visa? And now, accolades are in order. I want to congratulate you for choosing a challenging vocabulary building program and sticking with it. Consider this. In several hours, you have approximately tripled your normal vocabulary growth rate and learned more about the language than many people do in a lifetime. You have an impressive set of verbal tools now, and I have shown you how to use them. But don't stop now. When it comes to language, there is always room for improvement. I exhort you to review the portions of the program that you found most interesting or difficult, and also to read more, read widely, and use your dictionary. Remember, with a minimum of effort, you can continue to expand the boundary of your vocabulary for the rest of your life, and your diligent study of words will help open the doors to knowledge and success. I also would like to thank you for accompanying me all the way through this graduated tour of the English language. If you enjoyed Verbal Advantage and feel you benefited from it, why not tell a friend, relative, or coworker about the program? Now that you're so verbally advantaged, you'll need to find a few people with whom you can dipnosophize grandiloquently and engage in floxinosa nihilopilification. Now, my friend, it's time for me to say farewell. I've enjoyed being your guide, and I hope you've enjoyed the tour. As the late John Charty used to say, good words to you. Until we meet again, for Verbal Advantage, this is Charles Harrington Elster.